Hello, I'm uh, Professor Kay Wilhelm. I'm a consultation liaison psychiatrist at St Vincent's Hospital and that means that I deal with a lot of people with complex problems to do with um, grief, depression, suicidality. Um, so I'm going to talk today about grief and depression from a psychiatric viewpoint. The first thing is some definitions. Um, I'm not going to talk at length about grief but just to acknowledge it is a natural response. It's a, a painful process. Uh, it can be expressed in many ways and it can affect people's physical and emotional health. But I, when I talk to people about grief, I talk about it as being uh, an emotional spring cleaning in that I think people bring out all the issues around the loss, the good and the bad, and hopefully throw out the, the bad and, and keep the good. And that's what I encourage people to do. Um, from a, a psychiatric point of view, a labelling point of view, grief can be become complicated in various ways and that's one of the things we're going to talk about. So when does a, a normal mood state become abnormal? It can be when it is too intense, when it's too long lasting, when it seems appropriate to the, the precipitant, the trigger, and where is it different from depression, in depression people seem to lack this capacity for spontaneous remission um, and that is one of the ways that it can be different to grief. So what is depression? Um, whereas grief is something that you can work through, depression as I've said can stay with you and can people can lose this ability to be able to turn it off as they need to. But there are some things that they have in common, particularly uh, times of lack of appetite and sleep, the more specific, non-specific hallmarks of um, depression. And in that way, um, I, I think they're similar, but grief I've found, and I also found from my own experience, tends to come in waves and can be put away at other times. And depression doesn't have that, that kind of feeling and it is much more persistent. It's also accompanied by loss and despair, feelings of blackness and a lot of what's called rumination going over and over about um, poor self-esteem, um, blaming and, and guilt and feeling of being slowed down. And I'll get on to what all that's about. Um, you might say, well, people when they're grieving also feel um, they have self-recriminations. And it, yes, it is common with grieving to say, I wish I'd done more for that person or if I'd been there on that day or that sort of thing. The, the, the recriminations in depression are much more to do with the past and um, can bring up things that have been forgotten for um, decades that keep coming back. Uh, so it much more has this feeling of self-punishment. Um, and just to go over what depression is though, we all have normal mood swings and that is part of life and some people have more of them than others and this can be uh, related to their personality, their temperament and to some extent to cultures. Some cultures ex encourage more emotional expression than others. With depression, um, these questions about whether they feel depressed is one, but whether they've lost their feeling of um, worthlessness, sorry, whether they've lost their feeling of self-worth and become uh, feeling worthless and feeling hopeless and much more self-critical and feel like giving up. They would be hallmarks and pointers towards a clinical depression. So this is what dep clinical depression looks like in, in sort of psychiatric terms, in labelling terms, that people have a number of symptoms and say some of the non-specific ones and some of those more specific ones and in diagnostic terms that they have a persistent change in mood that goes on for at least two weeks and the term disorder means that it's having a significant impact on their life, their functioning and, and or they're seeking help for it. So I've mentioned that, that the key features are this lack of self, this drop in self-esteem, more self-criticism and depressed mood, but not everyone expresses it as depressed mood. And these rather non-specific um, features which can overlap with a number of other conditions. And the ones I'm going to talk about that are, are worrisome 
are features to do with what I'm calling a melancholic depression. And anhedonia is a, a loss of joy, an inability to be um, cheered up. The ruminations, which are just thoughts that just go round and round and round, and relentlessly feeling hopeless, um, having what's called dial or mood variation, where they um, usually in the morning feel terrible, and as the day goes on, feel better, and then worse again the following morning. And this sl being slowed down mentally and physically, and often with cognitive changes and suicidality, and in the extremes, uh, intense agitation and psychosis. Uh, and that's what a melancholic looks like. So it's a depression, but it's got these psych what are called psychomotor changes, and it's really important to register them. It's often the family that actually register them. So that's a melancholic depression, and often people will say they can't think any longer, they don't know how they managed with their life in general, um, and the family say there is a change in, in their behaviour. Now there are two kinds of, of melancholia. One is what's called a functional melancholia, which occurs in younger people. This has a, a strong genetic predisposition, there's usually a family history of either depression or bipolar disorder. Um, the other group that get it though are people who take stimulants. So I'm talking about cocaine, amphetamines, uh, which in the short term make people elated, but then make them feel intensely depressed. And um, that if they've got the, the genetic predisposition to a melancholia, can go on and develop this. Um, and that is what's called a functional shutdown of these pathways, which have to do with how you express emotion and it tying up with memories that uh, go along with it. Now the other group that um, get this melancholia are an older group and here it's not so much to do with family history but more to do with underlying physical illness, and generally cardiovascular disease. This has been called late onset depression, this is more what endogenous depression is all about and it's now called vascular depression and it has an increased uh, risk of delirium and uh, here if you do an MRI scan the, the, the um, I'm just showing you this you see some little microvascular infarcts along those same pathways. Clearly this is tied up with history of hypertension, vascular disease, diabetes, smoking. Now the other important thing obviously is to think about doing a suicide risk assessment in people who've got this kind of depression and this is, has got a high risk of suicide so it's important that people recognise it and also that they think about um, depression. Those are some of the questions that can be asked. So going back to the, the where this fits in with um, with grief, there are a number of different trajectories that can happen. Now, I'm going to go through each of these. First one is that the person is grieving and they then get over the grief in what is a, an expected time frame and an expected way, but then they go on and develop a depressive illness. And this may be because they've uh, developed an illness. It may be, um, the other thing is that a lot of life events can still precipitate that vascular kind of depression. It could be that they've got a, um, they haven't been able to move on with their life even though they've grieved and they've got a sense of isolation and uh, they're feeling rather hopeless and a bit trapped. Um, then there are some people who develop an initial grief but it then continues and slowly morphs into a depression. And other people who have been, they say they've been depressed all their lives and they have more of a probably a history of trauma or a history of not being able to cope, um, what we would call a, a vulnerable personality style. And this is just one more thing along that um, trajectory uh, that they have to cope with. And they do have different treatment implications. So if you go with the first one, and in terms of diagnostic categories, you could say that, that this is either a new episode of depression or a complicated grief, depending on how they appear in, um, in relationship to each other. But here it would be a matter of, uh, of dealing with the depression as it's arisen 
and uh, at times this can be because people have developed a new illness. It can be an onset of diabetes and um, it's now realised that diabetes, in fact, a lot of it is stress related. So it's, it's conceivable that someone can be uh, have a grief episode, have to deal with that and as part of that and the stress of dealing with that, that they can actually uh, have a a re-emergence or an, a beginning of a new physical illness which in turn can lead to depression. And I'm talking about things like an autoimmune disease or uh, say diabetes or um, also if they're older it could be that they're developing uh, a cognitive changes to, due to dementia. Now all of these can present as depression and so it's a matter of dealing with the depression and then going back and seeing if the grief has been thoroughly um, dealt with or new issues have emerged as part of that. Um, I guess one of the issues might be if the person has developed this sort of illness that um, the person who they're grieving has had, for example, and that may bring up new issues. The other situation is somebody has been grieving and then over time it's just not resolving and it slowly morphs into a, a depressive episode and that's where the real trick comes about trying to work out when it's still grief and when it's become depression. Um, when it becomes depression, instead of life getting easier, life is becoming harder and they're perhaps withdrawing more, they have maybe have started some new activities, found a little bit of peace in their lives but now it's going back the other way. And so asking those questions about um, whether they're able to be cheered up, whether they're uh, still getting joy out of their normal activities, what their sleep's like, and particularly if they're becoming much more slowed down and if they're ruminating and maybe bringing up um, new things from the past. Just say on that count, um, our memories can play tricks on us because when you put down memories, you put them down with an emotional tag so that if you have been very guilty or very sad um, and you become guilty or sad again, you actually retrieve old memories from the past that have got that same emotional tag which, which can be um, difficult and, and it can sort of make sense of what can happen for some people here. At some stage or other in both of those cases, uh, you may consider using an antidepressant. Um, Antidepressants are not advised for grief itself. Grief is a process that needs to be worked through and antidepressants can in fact impede the grieving process. Um, but if they have now become clinically depressed, it may be um, that then it's worth considering giving them an antidepressant and as I say then going back and regrouping around the grieving process. Then there's another group of people who say they've been depressed all of their lives. This generally has to do with people who've had a, a very unhappy life, a so very what we call a prejudicial childhood. It may be related to some trauma events in their childhood. And the, this grief event is just one more of a whole litany of things that's happened to them. Um, some of this is just bad luck. Some of it may be things uh, that they've brought on themselves because of um, perhaps using substances which have led to them making unwise decisions, etc. However, here the grief is still obviously important but it's equally important then to go back and try and help them address some of the other issues in their life. So here um, it's often a case of addressing the trauma, it may be addressing substance use, it may be addressing other activities they've had that are rather self-defeating. Um, so that this generally leads to a, a longer course. It's also going to be complicated if the person who has died that they're grieving uh, is part of the trauma that's been induced in the past. And the other terrible irony is that if people have had a complicated relationship with the person they're grieving, it's, all, it's harder for them to grieve that, that person. So that if they wish they were dead, for example, and they die, that can impede their grief process. 
Uh, and that's where you need to go back later and, and try and help them work through what's actually gone on. So what would I do as a psychiatrist if I'm dealing with people who are, who are in that situation? I mean, obviously it's important that they can understand what's going on and there are some good um, materials around to help people with that now. Some online, some um, I'm sure will be addressed by other people, educating them on all of this. There's a technique which I find very useful called expressive writing, um, where people write about trauma from their past, write about what's going on for them for a number of days in a row. If they've had a lot of trauma, it's advised they do this with, a, with the knowledge of somebody else who doesn't necessarily read what they've written but knows that what they're doing and can address issues that come up. There's a whole lot of literature around that and if anyone's interested, I'm happy to pass, pass that on. Obviously, um, referral for specific grief counselling is important. It's a matter of working out at what point that's going to be most useful and talking to the person about that. It can be a really important time to help people look after themselves better and sleep is clearly important. Um, and helping people uh, have better sleep hygiene. And there's now better information about that too. It's not just a matter of not having caffeine. But um, there are some particular exercises people can do before they sleep. Um, exposing them to morning light can help. Um, having a wind down routine, doing some writing before bed, using lavender oil on the pillow can all help. There's a lot of information now about diet and the importance of your microbiome. Uh, and I encourage people to use a Mediterranean diet and look after themselves. Exercise is incredibly important and can also help with dealing with both grief and depression. And it's a matter of finding the right exercise. Using exercise and exposing yourself to the morning light is extremely helpful. And obviously substance use. And using substances can also interfere with the grieving process and cause depression. And uh, I'm an enthusiastic anti-smoker. Uh, most people don't realise that smoking a pack of cigarettes a day leads to four times the rate of suicidal ideation and again can impede the grieving process. It also causes new onsets of depression. Antidepressants have their place for some people, particularly if they have a clear-cut clinical depression. They can also help with sleep. Some antidepressants can help with sleep. Clearly they need somebody uh, to monitor that and it's generally the GP that can be a psychiatrist. Um, and to make sure that they haven't got any suicidal ideations part of that. I just have to turn my lights back on again. Um, then there's a matter of what other mental health issues there might be and some of them might come to light for the first time. For example, if somebody has had a very close-knit relationship with their spouse but they're actually being socially phobic or may have a low-grade um, schizophrenia and the spouse has um, protected them and it now becomes apparent if that person's not around. Uh, so it can be a time as part of the grieving process to perhaps start new behaviours to um, perhaps be able to venture forth more. I'm a great enthusiast for interpersonal therapy. I'm going to mention a paper on the next page. Uh, there is also something called interpersonal counselling which can be used by therapists who are not used to using interpersonal therapy. But one of the uh, specific domains in interpersonal therapy is grief and it's got very much a, a, a flavour of um, getting the person firstly to grieve but then to take up new roles which is clearly important here. And it's also useful to, for depression so it can be a very useful therapy here. And as I said, using the whole process as I mentioned emotional spring cleaning as a way of uh, promoting growth and being able to perhaps start a new life. Um, and just to mention on the, that article, I've written a, an article that is available in the GP magazine but I think it's freely available about using interpersonal therapy and it, it shows some of the domains and questions you can ask but it, it may be useful. The other thing that I um, have which didn't unfortunately come out in these slides as a series of little cards which have um, some techniques that people can use but I think learning to use mindfulness skills, learning problem solving skills, 
I've mentioned the expressive writing, um, being able to uh, take up new activities and to venture forth. And one of the, um, the, the phrases that I give people is, no one can go back and make a brand new start, but anyone can start from here and make a brand new ending. But trying to use this as an opportunity to, to move forward if possible. And as I say, it is possible to help the person deal with grief and depression. I'm going to leave it there and thank you very much for your time.